Journalists can affect people's lives, and it all depends on the stories that you're doing. Journalists have a responsibility to convey the truth, to, to show situations absolutely the way that they are. I'm Dave Rust. I've traveled the world as a cameraman for CNN since it went on the air in 1980. You go on a story to Rome or something like that and get to shoot in the Sistine Chapel, or you go to Egypt and you're, you're shooting inside the pyramid. Going down to the South Pole, we got to go visit some of the cabins where the uh, Arctic explorers had been in the early part of the century and we'd get to walk in and it's so dry and so cold down there that there was still meat on the table, seal meat on the table of these Arctic explorers. And I think that uh, there's places that I've, I've had some unbelievable experiences. If I had to describe Dave Rust in sort of like the fewest words possible, the words would probably be um, generous, kind, kleptomaniac, insomniac slash narcoleptic. Come business, you know we'll keep harassing him. Very happy for him. You know, I'm sure he's going to have a lot more time to spend with the kids and the grandkids and trying great restaurants, but I think it is an absolutely huge loss for us, for the company, for all the journalists that he works with. He just had so much to offer. He was such a go-to person all the time. Nice to work with you. Yes. Yeah. So Dave had gone to Kent, uh, Kent State. You were a student there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, were you ROTC? Yep. So he was ROTC, and he said, I, I'm not, I hope I'm not putting words so in your mouth. So were you there on May 4th? Yeah. And, and you said that was what changed your direction in life. It was at the shootings at Kent State University. And, uh, it was a big historical event. It became a big historical event. I was a witness to it, and I saw the impact that the news had on the event, the impact that that coverage had on the world. I just kind of became attracted to that and wanted to be part of it. CNN in 1980 was ambitious. It was uh, a combination of a lot of young people with a lot of older, experienced people. They were given new life by coming to a 24-hour day news operation. And they were revitalized by the young people that were there. And so the combination of the two was fantastic. It's just an amazing way of life and, and you get to experience things that the only reason you get to experience them is because you have that camera and you're trying to convey those experiences to other people. So uh, it's just a real privilege. I drove up to uh, New York that night and I was live by three in the morning in New York City. And the next day I was in a helicopter with the Coast Guard. I got the only aerials of uh, Ground Zero before they closed the airspace on 9-11 and it was just uh, a surreal experience. Covering the Gulf War in 91 and to be able to uh, actually go in during the war and cover the bombardment as it's happening, uh, and knowing that you're going live as, as your allied airplanes overhead are bombing the city around you, and actually seeing cruise missiles fly by is a fairly unique experience. The Amaria shelter when it was bombed, where, where a crowd uh, brings you into the shelter, and you actually, uh, you, I, I got to go into the shelter as it was on fire, and they were trying to put the fire out there, uh, was an amazing experience. When I first got to Bosnia, there were so many sites. And what happened is that uh, that's, uh, that car was actually hit nine times while I was in it. And that one window on the right-hand side, the driver's side of the car, we were going down uh, the main avenue in the city. And that is head high, right where the driver sits. Um, that got hit probably by an AK-47. And you could hear it, it's like, it would be like if you hit a sledgehammer 
on the side of the car. We were just glad it was a bullet resistant glass. While I was at Parker Center covering a press conference after the Rodney King verdict, uh, CNN decided to send me down to the first AME church where they were going to have a service that was going to call for peace and calm in the city. All of Los Angeles was on fire by that time, and everywhere we went there was fires going. People were looting, and um, we were driving slowly, and I was leaning out the window shooting some shots, and uh, I see this bat come by, and, and it bounced off the front of the vehicle. And uh, I turned to the driver, I said, oh, uh, step on it, you know, let's get out of here. And then by this time, another bat was coming and it bounced off the windowsill into the car. This flew through the window of our camera van not long ago, grazing our cameraman, Dave Rust, and then landing in the front seat of the van. This is among the weapons that are on the streets of South Central Los Angeles tonight, along with handguns, rifles, automatic weapons, and firebombs. And then you hear a pew, pew with a gun. You see, I, I don't know which direction it was fired, but you could see the uh, flash and the gun. And, and by this time, the producer is screaming at this driver to move, and then he finally takes off. That was a little close. <laughs> this is for Blyland. This producer who, who always liked to get these great shots and stuff like that, and he thought it would be a really good idea if I were to stand in against this picture, I didn't know how, a lot about this picture, but apparently this picture had a pretty good curveball. I watched him as he got wound up, got ready to pitch. All of a sudden, I see this ball coming at my head. I mean, it was coming right at my head. And I think I probably jumped two feet to the right and, and uh, out of the way, because I know it was going to hit me. And, and then all of a sudden, it went right, right across the front of the plate. And I hear this laughing, not only from the crowd, but I think my producer was laughing too, pretty, pretty much. And I, I probably I looked like a pretty much of a fool, but I said, okay, okay, this, this is what I expected. And I, I told the pitcher again, I said, listen, I, I, I moved, I didn't get the shot very well, I gotta go do that one more time. So I, I sat there and I, I closed my eyes the third time. I, and I guess it came over. That was my shot with Burt Blylevin, and he ended up in the Hall of Fame, so uh, thank you for not hitting me, Mr. Blylevin. I haven't written a check in 30 years. And she runs the finances, she runs the house, she, uh, um, I can rely on her, she's raised the family. Both my daughters enjoy traveling, and uh, I think we have a lot of shared values from what I do and what they like to do. I warned Emily that uh, to stay out of the profession, to stay away from photographers, pretty much, uh, but she didn't pay any attention to me and, and got into it, and she loves it. She's, uh, she's taken over for her mother, telling me what to do. It used to be uh, when I started out, uh, this is uh, Dave Russ's daughter now, uh, this is uh, Emily Russ's father, is the way they refer to me. This is a CP16A. It's a uh, film camera. I had this in 1978 when I did overnight breaking news in Los Angeles. I uh, was working with Peter Arnett in Baghdad. In fact, this is a shot that I shot. It's from my camera in Baghdad. While I was in Bosnia, the, the Japanese company came out with a thing called the War Journalist style. Here's uh, some of the outfits that I wore when I was in uh, Bosnia, my plaid shirt and vest. And here's what they came out with the War Journalist doll. Fairly similar. Uh, this sign came from um, in front of the El Rashid Hotel. Uh, when the U.S. troops finally made it to Baghdad, uh, they had a firefight right in front of the hotel. We were doing a story with uh, Hank Aaron on baseball in Cuba. And uh, as you can see from the picture there, we had dinner with Fidel Castro. And uh, Hank Aaron asked him to sign some baseballs. And uh, when he was finished, uh, Mr. Aaron gave each one of the crew uh, a baseball as a souvenir. Well, this is my presidential bedroom. It, uh, it's where I store all of my uh, presidential memorabilia. 
when I was in Moscow, I, they had a little presidential commemorative uh, of Bill Clinton, uh, and uh, they have some of his friends there. Not sure who everybody is, but. I have plates all over my dining room, all over the walls and all the sides. And uh, what I try to do is when I go to a hotel that's a, either a journalist hotel or a famous hotel, I try to get a charger plate from them and I bring it back home. I think I really, really enjoy history. And I think that the, the old things represent history. And I think that uh, I, just, I just like to look at the past and I like to uh, save some of that past. After a while, you just kind of run out of room in the basement. So I uh, took advantage of the back steps of my house and uh, put some of the cameras there. This goes back to the uh, probably 82, into the 2000s. This is Bob Simon's book from the first Gulf War. This is just after he was being released in Baghdad after being captured. He decided to sign it. It says, thanks for giving me a hand on the cover. And that's my hand on the cover. This is a timepiece that was used on Judge Ito's bench uh, during the O.J. Simpson trial. Every once in a while while I'm covering a candidate and I get close to the podium or wherever they are and I'm shooting cutaways or whatever, I look at the uh, podium and see if they've left anything up there, maybe a script. Uh, maybe a bottle of water. This is from uh, Barack Obama. It's uh, from the uh, final week of the 2008 campaign. That was with Special Forces just as we uh, got to Baghdad in the Second Gulf War. And we were walking through uh, what became the Green Zone in one of Saddam's palaces. This uh, had been blown off the palace and was littering the streets when we went by. And I later found out that these are Saddam's initials. Baby Jessica Sock is uh, one of the uh, key items that they were interested in. I got that when I was uh, covering the um, rescue of baby Jessica. I think she was in a wellhead for 58 hours back in 1987. The Dallas crew had been down there for hours and hours and hours, and uh, we actually flew in from Los Angeles while she was still in the well to relieve them, and then they wouldn't, wouldn't go because they wanted to see what was gonna happen, and so once they brought the baby up, uh, I noticed them checking out her foot, her, the, the sock fell off as they were uh, transporting her to the uh, ambulance, and I didn't think she'd need this sock, so I, somehow I ended up with the sock, and uh, uh, the rest is history. The second uh, documentary that I worked on with Dave was called uh, Harsh Continent, Life in Antarctica. And there's a lot of history there. We walked in there and I was like, Dave, you take it. There's a $250,000 fine. And you won't get to keep it. We walked in the first hut. He's like, I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. We walk in, he was like, <clears throat> I was worried he was going to steal the reindeer boots, reindeer, you know, the wool underwear. You saw any of this in the basement? I don't want to know. I, I think I'm going to miss uh, not working. I, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy interfacing with the people. I enjoy meeting new people. I enjoy the access to the to the stories. I think he's lasted so long because he truly has a passion for what he does. I just kind you of sleep my way no, out. You can't hide. It's so nice to <laughs> see you. Too. He's got eight million stories. He's somebody you could drive across country with. You know, that's kind of a good litmus test, I think, for being in the field with someone and he certainly hits that. Plus, he's good at what he does, right? Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm good doing to see well. you. Good to see you, too. So what's, what's, your, last, hey. what's your last day? June 30th. I've got to work with some of the best people in the world and got to go to some of the greatest places, and I think I was just at the right place at the right time.